Um, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Ryan Holmberg. Uh, Dr. Holmberg is a visiting lecturer at Duke University and an academic associate of the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Culture. As a freelance art historian and critic, he is a frequent contributor to the Comics Journal, Art Forum International, and Art in America. As an editor and translator of manga, he has worked with Breakdown Press, Drawn and Quarterly, Retrofit Comics, and Picture Box Inc. Uh, Picture Box, I, I like them when they were around. His edition of uh, Tezuka's The Mysterious Underground Men by Picture Box won the 2014 Eisner Award for Best U.S. Edition of International Material Asia. And he's also the author of Garo Manga, The First Decades, uh, 1964 to 1973, which, will, uh, which was published by Center for Art Books in 2010. So, Dr. Holmberg. Hi, thank you for having me. All right. So there's a the, the serious title of this talk um, is manga translation as typographic voice acting, and I'll explain that as I go along. Uh, the actual t title is only idiots make good manga translators, and this is not only about what Mari talked about in the sense that you need to pretty much have no uh, good sense about your own career in order to become a manga translator, but also because I'll explain at the end that it takes a certain kind of dumbing down of how one thinks about the voice and speech, uh, and a certain kind of play acting of kind of like stupidity to make good manga translation, I think, at a certain stage. Um, just to let you know, um, I didn't come into manga translation because I wanted to be a translator. Um, I got my PhD in art history. Uh, I wrote my PhD um, on 1960s manga, which was at that point kind of a rare thing in art history. This is 10 years ago. Um, I taught for a couple of years in the States, and then I was on a mix of grants, and then I wanted to work freelance for a while, so I needed to find a pay pa platform for my research. So the books that I do, and I think I've done about 10 of them, um, they usually have a very long, sometimes overly long essay at the end, a scholarly essay, that talks about the manga. Uh, almost all the manga I've done are old manga. They date mainly from the 1950s and 60s. So there's a historical essay at the end uh, with footnotes and everything. Um, so it's kind of like a manga translation with an essay, but I also kind of think of them on the model of art catalogs or exhibitions. Because in art, art catalogs or exhibitions, you have all the work in the exhibition, and then you have uh, scholarly essays by curators or art historians, etc. So my books are kind of like somewhere in between that, somewhere between an art catalog that's a narrative and a translation uh, project. So I wanted to create a pay platform for my research, and the only way to do that was actually to make books. Um, so I function not only as a manga translator, but uh, I'm also the agent. I select the work, I contact the studio or the artists, I uh, interview them typically. Um, I probably have a lot more control over the final shape of the book than most manga translators do. Um, there's a lot of back and forth between uh, me and the publishers about what goes in them uh, in terms of a lot of uh, checking of the translation, etc., and the layout. The reason I am allowed to do this um, is because I work mainly with small publishers, and of course that means less money, um, but if it all works out because this material I'm interested in is, an old, is old and doesn't have much of a market anyway, so uh, it all kind of works out, right, uh, in that sense. Um, so this is a cover, the front and back cover of uh, one book I did um, a few years ago, one of the first books from uh, Picture Box, which is now defunct, uh, sadly, but a publisher that's had a lot of impact on kind of alternative manga and comics publishing in the States sub subsequently. Uh, these are just kind of interior pages. This was an interesting project because it was a uh, facsimile edition of a 1948 uh, manga by Tezuka, one of Tezuka's earliest uh, masterpieces. We borrowed a uh, original copy from uh, Tezuka Productions and scanned it and then sent it back. Initially the plan was to use a copy at, from the Prang collection at University of Maryland. They have a large collection of occupation era materials. But for some reason the Prang collection is missing two or three of the most famous and expensive Tezuka manga. We think they're probably swiped at some point. We had to borrow this from uh, Tezuka Productions, right? Um, 
Um, I've done a lot of books around 1960s manga artists uh, related to a magazine called uh, Garo, which is a uh, magazine known for kind of the beginnings of experimental and literary manga uh, in Japan. Um, I'm an art historian, so I'm mainly interested in things that have a really strong visual content. So I'm also choosing the best pages, the most visual pages from these books, which you can also see are, the book, are oftentimes the pages with the least amount of translation. Um, <laughs> So uh, at the end, I have this bullet point that says manga translation is easy for me. But part of the reason is that I typically select manga, not intentionally to have less words. But part of the reason is that a lot of the stuff I translate belongs to a tradition called uh, Gekiga. And a lot of times in the early days, in the 50s and 60s, Gekiga was many things. But one of the things it was was basically how do you, t how do, you do visual storytelling? How do you tell stories in comics format, mainly through pictures? And, and reducing uh, text to speech acts only. So <clears throat> this medium is basically uh, a cinematic picture-based medium that uh, puts text and speaking to a, a secondary <laughs> position. Hence, the manga also don't have that much to translate, which I think is a good thing. Right? So this is a small, this is a small risograph book. Risograph is kind of like a color uh, Xerox type of, of, of technique that a lot of uh, small comics presses use now. This book did pretty well. It's in a second printing now. Um, a third book I did with uh, Hayashi's work um, is called Red Red Rock and Other Stories. Um, this came out last year from a publisher called Breakdown Press, which I am working with. Um, right now, uh, there's a, Hayashi had a book called Red Colored Elegy uh, was from Drawn and Quarterly. That's coming out of the paperback edition. Right now, I'm supposed to be writing the uh, uh, essay for that new edition. Um, what else? Uh, here's an extreme example of manga doesn't need translation. Um, uh, Sasaki Maki was kind of a pop art influenced artist writing for the magazine Garo in the 1960s and 70s. He was also the um, cover artist for a lot of Murakami Haruki's novels and collaborated with Murakami Haruki in different ways. And he, Murakami Haruki also wrote a small blurb for the Japanese edition of something that was like this book. Um, and, you know, there was, this was kind of an interesting, sometimes challenging uh, translation project, not in the typical way. Uh, Sasaki Maki, a lot of his work is wordless, and on top of wordless also narrativeless. Um, one of the more interesting works is called The Vietnam Debate. It's kind of a harsh criticism of uh, Japanese uh, consumer culture and its obliviousness to all the horrible things going on in the world at the time. Uh, particularly the Vietnam War and Japan's uh, contribution to the Vietnam War by hosting American military bases. He took the text, according to him, out of some left-wing uh, screed against uh, the American military and the Vietnam War, dropped out all the kana, and just did a series of kanji. So this is what you see on the left. And it looks basically like, it's just a series of kanji. Some people says it looks like uh, Chinese Culture Revolution placards. So it was kind of like a, that was like kind of the look of heavy politi political signage at the time. Um, and this was not so difficult to translate. It just meant looking up a, a shit ton of kanji uh, for the course of the book. Um, he also was um, tracing a lot of uh, material from ad advertisements for things like ath athlete's foot and uh, uh, store sales. So this is kind of an interesting, this is one of my favorite manga of all time. Uh, you can get this book, it's, it's quite interesting. As, a, as an artwork itself. Um, like I said, I've also been doing a lot of old historical gekiga. Some of you might know Tatsumi Yoshihiro. Uh, his gekiga was kind of inspired by another artist, a uh, friend of his named uh, Matsumoto Masahiko, who used the name Komaga, panel pictures, rather than gekiga. And here we also had a, a, he was the first person to really focus on this idea that manga storytelling should be around arrangement of picture panels, primarily. So we did an edition of this that went out of print very quickly, and I'm pressing the publisher now to do a reprint and expansion, expanded edition of this maybe for next year. <clears throat> Something that I'm currently finishing up, this is a mock uh, cover, it is a collection of uh, stories by another Gato artist named Katsumata Susumu. Uh, Katsumata Susumu is an interesting character because he was trained as a nuclear physicist in the late 1960s, 
started drawing uh, kind of Tohoku northern fantasy stories for Garo in the 19, late 60s and 70s, and then joined the anti-nuclear power movement in Japan uh, right around 1980. He drew a couple of stories about uh, so-called nuclear gypsies, which are maintenance workers at nuclear power plants in Japan. He also did a lot of four panel strips uh, parodying accidents and risks in the nuclear power industry. Um, so this was a this this project's been going on for a while and was uh, kind of taken some twists and turns. Initially, I was supposed to do a uh, like a 5,000 word essay for it, and I got so into the topic of anti nuke manga that my uh, 5,000 word essay became 65,000 word book. <laughs> and initially, it was all supposed to be packaged together, but the publisher freaked out recently. So it's being split off now into an academic book with my text, with the more unmarketable political manga, and then the story manga are going to be uh, divvied out into a proper translation that should be out this by the end of this year. And actually, the contract got signed uh, yesterday for this. Another another contract that just got signed this morning uh, was through Retrofit Comics. Uh, another early 70s Gekiga artist named Baron Yoshimoto, who is not so well known even to most people in Japan, even though he was big in the set, early 70s. This project came about, this is a, this is a cover from a book in, that just came out in Japan. But Baron Yoshimoto, um, let's see. This project came to me because the artist's daughter uh, attended a, a taidan, a talk I did with Hayashi Seichi in Tokyo last summer, and then wanted me to help get her father's books into print. Um, I said, I said, sure, I'll find someone. So we're working with a small Philadelphia-based uh, publisher named Retrofit. Um, it's going to be pretty racy stuff. Um, it's kind of like Tatsumi Yoshihiro's work, but without all the kind of the symbolic veiling of issues. Um, now, Retrofit, I've worked with in the past. We did a small pamphlet of uh, Kondo Akino's work. Did she come today? Akino-san. Wow. But, um, we did a small pamphlet of this. Um, this is a, she did also very nicely did a cover for this English edition, which usually doesn't work. This was kind of a challenge, A, because a lot of Kondo Akino's work has uh, vertical text boxes. So we had to tilt the English. And I'm not going to go into details here, but if you pick this up and then find the original English, there's a couple stories in here where Akino-san is playing with the fact that pronouns are very, are, can be dropped in Japanese. So she has this one story where it's a, a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter, and it's going back and forth in time. So you don't necessarily which know which character and which generation is being spoken about, especially because they're all drawn similarly. But you know, I had to force Akino-san to say, who is she? You know, what, who are we referring to here? Because it just doesn't work all the time in English. Um, so this was kind of a challenge. And eventually, uh, I think I got busy with something else and I told, I mean, there was, we went through like 12 iterations and edits on this and eventually Akino-san Akino and the, the publisher were, the designer were in communication because it became uh, so confusing at the end. Um, now, the first book I did, which totally bombed and uh, the publisher suffered huge, a lot of economic loss, but... Uh, <laughs> group of uh, <coughs> slightly infantile young men collected while waiting to get their blood taken it might be talking about, right? But the thing that's really fun about this, I had to do this, is basically I had to shut myself in a room with no one around to do it, because I had to act out all the speech, right? Um, there's a little bit of me here, you know, it's like with, <coughs> you know, when I was young, young, uh, you know, you younger, you like talk in a trashy way. So it's like, it's like trying to like replicate that scenario and like trying to like strip out whatever uh, you know faint education in feminism or anything else I had, and try to like reduce myself back to some kind of uh, kind of like raw, raw, uh, unsocialized state to do this stuff. I mean, what is this? I remember this. I mean, this in terms of like you're talking about different words that you have to translate, but like. This one, they call her a ball buster. I think the original Japanese is 
腰を抜く、right? It's like she would throw my back out or something if you translate it literally. Which, if that was true, it sounded like she's a professional wrestler. So, <laughs> so we did this. So a lot of them are like talking, you know, in a in a, in a、uh, offensive way to the blood bank staff. And then it kind of became a problem with the publisher. There's this、uh, mock rape、uh, fantasy that happens at the end of one of the stories, and basically there's a context for it in which the male character is a returned veteran from World War II. He has flashbacks of an indistinct sort, but they're probably Flashbacks of, of either witnessing or performing、uh, sexual assault, probably while on the front in China during World War II. So when he returns to Japan and becomes an aging man in Tokyo in the 1960s, he tries to kind of recover his masculine potency by、uh, engaging with sexual relationships with a young woman who's willing. And they kind of both, on the both sides, kind of reenact this,、uh, these kind of like、uh, rape fantasies. Eventually, this is kind of The publisher okayed this because there's this context of war,、um, etc. Now, <clears throat> a book that I'm just finishing now is a, kind of a follow up to that Trash Market book.、Uh, this book will come out hopefully later this year from New York Review of Comics.、Um, you, many of you probably heard of New York Review of Books.、Um, they have now set up a graphic novel line, heavily inspired by Picture Box and John and Quarterly's line. Um, so, we've been talking about different titles. The one that I was able to get licensed was a net new collection of Tsuke Tadao's work. And here I'm just showing you some production files because I don't have the、uh, final translation yet. And basically, what I used to do is take a Word document and, you know, like number all the panels. So, this would be like page three, number one, so 3.1, 3.2, etc. If there was two balloons, it would be like 3.2. 3.2.2 or something like that. But now I've decided this is a much better way. It's not only clearer and less、um, possibility of the letter or putting the text in the wrong balloon, but also because I found that a lot of times when you're translating, you put it on a Word document, you kind of like miss, miss the matching between the head and the action and the speech. And by the time it got into the layout form, I realized it just didn't sound good as speech. It might have sounded fine as a raw translation on a piece of paper. But by doing it this way, it also can kind of immediately see like, how it might sound coming out of this guy's voice.、Uh, um, you know, probably when this gets back to me, I'll probably delete things like it's or something. You know,、um, Maybe that's not a good example, but、um, I'm just showing you what some of these production things look like. Right. I mean, I'd probably delete this. Angry? I'm angry. I doubt he would say, I'm angry. I'm probably to get rid of the I'm or something. Or he'd probably say, oh yeah, right? Something like that. Right, so I think it's、like、really important. You see a lot doing translation after it's laid out, right? How kind of like these characters interact and what they might necessarily say in a dialogue, which is very different from、uh, translating discrete、uh, segments of text. And then there's also, once again, a kind of nasty thing a bunch of、uh, vagrants talking、uh, on the street. This is very much kind of Tsuge's world. He was very interested in kind of raw representations of kind of the underclass、um, in Tokyo at the time. Again, without all the kind of the, merit, the metaphorical veiling that someone like Tatsumi、uh, employs. Right? Now, thinking about voice and thinking about speech balloons and how to translate voice so it sounds like believable speech. Um, I was always interested as a scholar in kind of the, his the history of、uh, sound effects in manga and comics,、uh, the theory of them, what they do,、um, and also, you know, thinking about manga basically as a multi sensory medium, even though you kind of commune it, com you consume it all through your eyes, that there is a kind of soundtrack to it through the speech, uh, uh, through the sound effects especially. But also, if you think about an actual as spoken speech, there's kind of a soundtrack and a vocal, vocal element in that sense. Voice meaning not just spoken text, but spoken text through a body, right? Capturing that body side of it. And I remember from doing some research on Tezuka Osamu, in a number of his how to manga books、uh, series that he did, there was one called Manga Kyoshitsu from 1954.、Uh, and he talks about his dream of having a manga book. That can play a background music inside of it. So here you have the manga book, and then it has this machine in it for playing background music to it. I think at some point he also talks about that he 
He wishes it also had smell coming out of it. What is that? Somewhere down here. And then at the end, right, there's an explosion, and the book actually explodes, right, to it. So I actually really like this idea, but I felt like, you know, he's basically saying that the printed book is actually a kind of uh, quasi-sound machine. And if you really think and really embody your manga reading or comic book reading, and you actually sound everything out, it might be all visual, but there actually is a very strong sound component in it. That's not heard sound, but a kind of like interiorized sound that you get through reading. But important to remember that is that because it's interiorized, all sound in mangas is essentially, is essentially human voice, right? You're not hearing actual sound effects like you would in movies, right? You know, you've probably seen those like production uh, documentaries of old movies where it's like lightning and thunder and someone's, and then they show behind the scenes and someone's like shaking a saw or something in the back, you know? It's kind of like that, but now it's not saws and tools. It's all humans, right? So manga has this sound, but it's all humans making sounds, right? So maybe start thinking that, you know, like manga translation, at least if you're, if you're capturing sound and voice, and all sound is voice in manga, that it's kind of like somewhere between ventriloquy and somewhere between a human beatbox, right? And like a human beatbox tries to make these mechanical sounds, but through their chest and their vocal organs, right? And tries to simulate machine sounds and people who are good do it very well, but still there's like kind of an element of the body in it. And it's also something like ventriloquy, right? You're like, it's a human voice, and there's this inanimate, inanimate object over here, which is the book, but like the translator or the person writing it is constantly basically kind of like throwing their human voice into the book, right? So I thought like maybe someone could kind of construct a theory about manga sound as always voice, also always human, human voice. Um, and you know, this really came strong to me when I've done some translations of a uh, experimental manga artist named uh, Yokoyama Yuichi. This is another book that's coming out this year uh, called Iceland. Is anybody familiar with this artist's work, Yokoyama Yuichi? No. So he's basically just uh, kind of narratives of motion and sound, right? And you know, it's like if you actually, you can see it's like visually heavily abstracted, but if you actually like, what I have to do to translate, you have to sound this out, right? And if you, yeah, two minutes, okay. So, but if you actually sound this out, right? But if you actually read comics, you know, you sound out some sound effects, but you don't actually perform them out. And if you perform them out, you sound totally ridiculous. And it makes all manga basically, all comics basically comical. You could take Art Spiegelman's Mouse. You can take anything. You can take Joe Sacco's comics, the journalism. And if you were actually like performatively read them out loud with all the sound effects, anything sounds kind of silly and stupid in, in comics, right? So basically, you know, you would you just like, can you just imagine you're like, roar, roar, right? It sounds ridiculous. It's not a car sound anymore. It's like this stupid human making stupid sounds and projecting that into the manga. And if you really think about that while you're like reading manga, it just sounds, you know, it's like we. It's like ridiculous, right? And it's like, but the thing is, like, when we read comics, we don't necessarily. There's a little bit of that, but it's not. We don't perform it so much that we feel like our body's actually in the reading. But it's there in kind of a subdued way, right? Now I remember there's there's an old comic from the United States. It was also made into animation. A character named Gerald McBoing Boing. Uh, he was also it's from the 1950s. And Gerald McBoing Boing's uh, is a problem child because he can't speak human. He can only speak sound effects, right? So he grows up and he says, boing, boing, and he scares his uh, parents. He says, bang. And you can see what the artist here has also included the gun, because he wants you to know that it's not just a kid going, bang, it's actually the sound of a gun, right? That the, the, so the kid is actually making mechanical sounds. Now this causes problems at home. He can't make friends because of this problem. But eventually a producer at a, ra a radio company picks him up and says, boy, you're perfect for this gig. So he hires him and he does sound effects. They're not even effects anymore, he's actually making the sound, right? He's actually the saloon door swinging. He's actually the pistol and the horse clip copying, right? And he becomes famous for this, right? This is kind of like an interesting in-between point where it's actually a boy, he's making sound effects, but he's no longer a human sound effect. He's actually able to reproduce machine sounds, right? And I think like also, I'm gonna skip this, but. You know, this made me think about someone who got a lot of uh, air, uh, press in Japan was a, a guy named Toho uh, Rikimaru. He calls himself a professional manga reader, which is mandokuka. 
and he sits in uh, in Inokashira Koen in Kichijoji in Western Tokyo. And for the past 10 years or so, I think I first saw him about five years ago, maybe it's been, it's been 10 years, he performatively reads manga of the audience's choice. If you pay, I think, about 500 yen, he'll read you a chapter of your favorite manga. Uh, initially, he was using the original, the tankobon, the books, but subsequently he's gotten permission from the artist and kind of blown them up. So he does, he is like this person. He is like the ridiculous manga translator making all the sound effects, right? I wish I had a video clip, but he makes all the, you know, the... I, when I went, I asked him, a childhood favorite was Fist of the North Star, Hokuto Ken. So I had him do all the... <laughs> all that part, right? And then he also reminds me of an artist I've always liked, who is Aida Makoto, Japanese English, right? And it also reminds me of a recent, more, uh, another Aida uh, uh, work that I really like, and this is called Sekai Baka Kaigi. And what you have in the middle is this, highly educated woman who does perfect simultaneous translation and gets everything right. So, but she's been hired to simultaneously translate this international conversation, right? International conference is like what you really need the professional interpreter for. So on one hand is like this drunk French guy and the other one is this front drunk Japanese guy and they're just talking about garbage. So they have this perfect translator in the middle translating these two people, right? And I feel like a lot of, at least a lot of the manga I've done, you know, it's like, I'm not a professional tsuyaksha, but like, you know, I want to be her. And I do oftentimes, like, I feel like I'm translating these two people, right? It's like Tsuke Tado's world specifically, it's like some scum bucket from Tokyo in the 60s that I'm trying to translate into some hobo in Manhattan in the 1960s. And it's like, I feel like I'm mad. It's like, I have a PhD and I'm translating these two people? What the hell am I doing? <laughs> So that, that gives me eight bullet points to finish with. Uh, I'm not a professional manga translator. As I said, I came about it in a back door. Uh, manga translation is pretty easy, though I think that's only because the manga I do, which are old. Old manga are pretty easy to read, or super easy to read. I would have a bear of a time doing the stuff you do, without a doubt. Um, manga translation is usually boring intellectually for me, unless I can make it myself fun through performance. Uh, and I think most anybody with decent language skills can do manga translation. Um, again, I think, I think newer manga are harder because they're much more colloquial. I think a lot of them are fairly hard. Um, and which is to say, I think even idiots can do manga translation decently. However, I think that actually only idiots can do manga translation well, because you kind of like need to become that, you know, you need, to, you need to become this person at some point when you're doing trans translation, right? You need to embrace this person. And I don't know if all manga translators do that. You know, it's also really hard to be like a good idiot in a way, in that sense. And so therefore, I wish I were a better idiot, then I'd be a better manga translator. To be a good manga translator, you need to speak both languages fluently uh, like an idiot. And I think a lot of this has to do with also like thinking about manga translation in terms of voice and like throwing your body into the book as a translator, but also as a reader and feel that bodily reading and translation and writing. Thank you.